Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. On this Thanksgiving evening, actually it's the day after Thanksgiving, technically. California time, anyway. Hawaii's still there. So, the Patreon people know this already. And I mentioned a little hint to this in the, one of the previous episodes here. But there's something I'm starting to call trust learning. It's a, it's a small concept, but it's also a big concept. And it's a real simple thing, and it's based on a couple different concepts that we sort of need to understand in a big way. We grew up as little kids, trusting the reality that we observe, the real, reality that we experience. And to the degree that we can actually confirm it with our own hands and phalangize, it's pretty real. Uh, this is soft, this is uh, hard, this is hot, this is cold, this is just right. But the big problem we're running into in the 21st century is that we've been several decades into this thing now, if not centuries, into something I'm calling trust learning. We inherently trust first, and then through getting bit by lies and betrayal, we start to be a little more suspicious. Now, any old wise person will tell you, you don't want to get into the world of being cynical to the point you can't actually enjoy life and communicating with other human beings. But I think that there is a very comfortable methodology that can be used to evaluate information without protest, without killing the messenger who might be simply repeating something that they've trust learned as well. Now, there's not a single person hearing my voice that hasn't fallen for this formula and probably is still falling for this formula. But once you start realizing that you've been trust learning your entire life, you have to start inserting the pause. And it's difficult. It is very, very difficult. The only hope a child could have is to have enlightened parents that simply say, okay, here's the thing. My daughter, my son. When you get told something is true, understand that that's the opinion of the person that was speaking at the time. And don't tell them that you don't believe that necessarily, just hold that in as a possible reality until you're able to confirm it. If, under any circumstance, you are unable to confirm it for your entire lifetime, that it merely was an opinion about things. Understand that people will try to prove things to you by presenting what they call facts. Now, a fact can be part true, but also be connected to an erroneous cause. You'll know if you're an OG listener that I will constantly talk about the idea that we can develop mathematical algorithms that actually predict things, but they're not necessarily the causality models that they tell us. For instance, when Galileo drops the two balls off the Leaning Tower of Pisa to determine whether or not gravity pulls on a heavy, heavier object more than a lighter object, he observed that they pretty much hit the ground at the same time. Now, we understand now that through very intense scientific process that the heavier one does hit slightly first, but it's so infinitesimal because the force of gravity is so weak. I mean, gravity exists. Things get pushed to the ground. You can debate all day about what you think it is, and that's what this exercise is about. It's before you pee yourself, just listen up. Now, at the point of Galileo's discovery, he didn't really know what it was. Nobody knew what gravity was. To this day, it's a phenomenon in most dictionaries. I think I know because of ethereal sciences, but We'll just put that aside, too, because it's hard to confirm. It's just that that theory explains everything in the entire universe. Okay, that's fine. But let's just say that Galileo was willing to present to the Jesuit priests of the time that he thought it was mass pulling against mass, that the earth was so huge it's actually pulling everything down. I don't believe he actually understood that, but let's just say he did. And the Jesuits say, oh my God, that is actually going to start interfering with the belief in God. It's going to abstract away the belief from God into this thing called science. we got to get a control of this. But we can't say something that's going to deny that it's actually occurring because everybody can drop something off the top of their house or the highest tower. So we have to figure out a way to frame this, to spin this in a way that it's still true. We can generate mathematics around it that are predicting it properly. But we have to keep it in the eyes of God. And so they come up with something called angel power. In an algorithm, it could be AP, angel power. 
and they merely replace whatever force is causing this with AP. All the mathematics work out. So many angels push down on an object, and that's how fast it's going to move. At terminal velocity, well, they feel like it is biblically moving at the proper speed that God wanted it to do, and therefore don't apply any more pressure to it, etc., etc., etc. The mathematics would work. The formulas would work. But the causality of the formula would be different probably from reality. Watch it be angel power when we get to heaven. Now, that is my made-up story. No Jesuit priest, as far as I know, ever suggests a modification to what was evolving at the time. But if you trust learn, you're going to believe in a ton of stuff that isn't true. And to be honest, no matter how radical you think your beliefs are, including my ethereal sciences, it's hard for me to confirm what I believe. There's an interesting character that was developed in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in the second book, which is the 12th episode of the BBC broadcast, where they go visit the guy who they believe is running the universe, and he's this really existential dude. And even though he sees what he thinks are spaceships landing, and men who he believes are coming to his front door, he is not sure that they are actually either spaceship or men. He refers to the Lord in the conversation, and they stop and they say, oh, well, if, uh, if you believe in the Lord, he says, my cat, I call him the Lord. At least I think he's a cat. If you could operate in that absolute sense of abstract thought, then you would probably be the most accurate human being in terms of taking in information and evaluating it. But we like to have a little bit more substance to our reality, right? Because one thing that we do believe leads to something else we do believe, and we get causality. We get to create bigger and better things by stacking cards on top of cards until we build a castle of cards, right? How many things that have we learned in the last five years that we believe are no longer true? It's, it's, it's really split into two categories. Things that we believe weren't true and we think we found the replacement for it that is true or more true, or the things that we believe we simply, uh, were simply invented and fabricated out of nothing. And then we simply don't believe it anymore, which changes the way we perceive others who are telling us that this stuff is true. Just as some examples. What are some examples so that we can just get this conversation framed up really well in your mind? Well, I think one of the biggest ones that has come up in the last, say, six years was the complete explosion of Flat Earth being reintroduced to the masses in uh, 2015. I mean, it blew up in that year. There's always been a society around that believes that it's flat. The problem is, is that even though there's a lot of quote-unquote facts, things that we believe are unquestionably one way or another, the flat earth people are now in the same predicament that the heliocentric people are in. The heliocentric people have a bunch of theories that completely explain how water bends around a sphere. Again, you see bubbles in water all the time, and it's the exact same model. Not the same cause, but the same model. I mean, it is the same cause, it's just they haven't documented it properly. But the idea is that when you go out to a beach and you don't have more of an existential scientific background, you see flat uh, oceans and you think, oh my God, this thing can't be, can't be what they say it is. Now again, probably there's a bunch of misconceptions in both camps. But what's nice about it, as I've said several times, is that we now have folks thinking differently for the very first time in mass. And that is very valuable because it will lead to something else, most likely in different categories of reality, that will assist us in divorcing ourselves from a lot of things that we trusted into our learning system. The dinosaur. Completely a bogus construct. The dinosaur has all kinds of organic elements to it that is supposed to really abstract away from a Bible, from a God creating us, even though it's an, it's an asinine thought that just because God exists that he couldn't have created these beings. He created more animals, insects, and fish than he ever created human beings. Probably damn near an infinite to one ratio. So to say he couldn't create these big creatures, uh, because if he did, then he doesn't exist, is an absurd deduction, in my opinion. However, all the science doesn't work out. Now, again, it gets a blurred line, just like how they redefine certain medical regiments in this world today. It's just if you don't like the definition, if you're not going to take their stuff, they redefine it so that you have to take it or you want to take it. It's the same thing. 
But two guys started this little scam, probably organically. As it unfolded, it became a bigger and bigger organization. More and more people got involved. It's not unlike an influencer on social media getting a bunch of kids to pay attention to them. One million, you start getting people looking at you. Five, well, they're looking at you. Ten, they're buying you. Anything over that, they're controlling you. 100%. So two guys get into a competition in the 1800s and start coming up with all these fake dinosaurs. Again, 104 of them were deemed absolutely fake, even by paleontologists. I think that's hilarious. But now, when they want one, they just engineer a new one. They got much better technology to craft them. They have a lot more understanding of the physiology of animals, a lot more predictions. They they load up all the scientific rags to kind of prime the pumps so that when they drop their new one, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, they said they were probably going to find this and poof, poof, poof. The infinitely complex can't predict when you're going to find the next thing bigger than the Tyrannosaurus or something else, uh, another Velociraptor kind of thing, they end up finding it because that's what they want you to believe. It makes it romantic. It keeps the series on TV going. It gets embedded in kids' movies. It gets embedded in sitcoms. Trust learning. How many crises do we have in this world right now that's all based on trust learning? All of them. All of them are trust learning. Whether or not we're populated too much or not is trust learning. I mean, again, we can exceed the world's resources. And in, in at least in three countries in this, or three regions of the world, this has already occurred. They have exceeded what they can produce. And they're living on borrowed time, trying to purchase what they need to keep their people alive from other countries. But that's going to run out if they don't control their population. But who pays the price? The first world countries pay the price because we're in the way of those who are intellectually trying to run the world the way they want. But now imagine you look at the entire repertoire of everything you've ever thought was real, everything you ever thought was true, some scientific method, and you look at it, and there's two categories, right? There's the fabled things like dinosaurs. There's the fabled thing called ice ages, as they have defined them to erase the world and rebuild the world every so many tens of thousands of years. Those events most likely never occurred as they have prophesied them, and those beings never ever existed uh, outside of woolly mammoths and maybe a saber-toothed tiger or something. A, a natural connection to beings that actually exist on this planet today. And they try to, obviously, fortify dinosaurs by saying that the biggest creature on planet Earth, and one of the smallest creatures on planet Earth, called a bird. Okay. And the other one is the area of sciences, like I just described. A bunch of causality that isn't happening for the reasons that you believe it's happening. And what that ends up doing is that makes you a consumer as a scientist. You can only consume what is out there. You can never invent anything because you don't know the true causality. Now, serendipity obviously creates a lot of things in laboratories, and that's where we get indications of things that are happening. And we might be able to deduce why that serendipitous thing is occurring but we're still going to have the causality models wrong. It is probably one of the most brilliant things that man does is to create some overlay fake science on top of something that is actually predictable. But once you start surveying your mind in the pantry of the deep thoughts university of true, false, and maybe in the middle, you will rearrange the entire deck. And you may end up putting most of what you believe is true in the center pile, which is the maybe pile. What you will keep as an imperative truth to yourself is the life that you have lived. Your parents were your parents. Your brothers and sisters were your brothers and sisters. Your life, your career, all that stuff did occur. Now, depending on how deep you analyze that, you may have elements of that that are different. Why did you get fired? Why did you get hired? Why did your product succeed? Why did it fail? There may be different reasons out there, but it may not matter as well. But I believe that you are deep thinkers and you're trying to extend your reality beyond just commonality, which is why we're having this discussion. We know that there's a huge effort in the world to erase history. There's a huge effort to keep history from being recorded. And there's even a 10x effort to rewrite history the moment that it happens, which is my episode that history is the matrix. They want to control every single bit that goes into your brain. Now, they know that they really can't do it effectively unless you adopt their digital medias. 
You have to. I was watching an old Doctor Who the other day, and there was a moment when the doctor had to tell a guy a piece of information. This is in the late 70s, early 80s with Tom Baker, and he had used his sonic screwdriver to jam sort of a microphone that was in the room, but he knew he was still being observed. So he had to get the guy over to a part of the room that wasn't being recorded by a video camera, and he ended up whispering to the guy because it's a screenplay. It's a teleplay, right? But we have forgotten that you can write something down on a piece of paper and give it to another human being, and they could burn it. And that information transferred from your brain to their brain without the chance of being picked up by digital mechanisms as long as you got a roof over your head. Interesting how we've forgotten the basics of life. But if you were to discover, or rediscover, I should say, areas of electricity, such as Faraday through Tesla, and figure out how it actually works, and start figuring out zero-point energy systems, start understanding that the entire universe is made out of the same particle, and that you can harness from that infinite energy, because it is all things. And you understand magnetic, uh, electromagnetic waves are on magnets. And you can configure magnets in a certain way, like the wheel at the uh, Coral Castle, where the guy spun it up, capacitated a bunch of electricity, and delivered it. It just depends on what you do with that information once you find it. I don't think that they're against you actually having it in your backyard, as long as you just use it for your own purposes. But the second you try to communicate it over the web... I'm willing to bet that out of all of the sort of surveillance software that's out there that's trying to find out whether or not you're waking up, the oldest algorithm out there is the algorithms around individuals displacing the energy uh, sectors of the world. If you start transmitting any type of electronic message, whether it be your voice, a text, uh, anything to somebody else, they're going to pick up on that one first. I'm going to put people on your doorstep. It happened to a friend of mine, and uh, he was my friend in high school. It happened to him about a decade ago. I helped him out, protecting himself. They blocked all of his fundraising. And I, I would think he was lying, honestly, no matter how his integrity is today, but it was observed by his girlfriend at the time, which is also from her hometown, and another buddy of mine whose integrity could be any higher. Got followed around by a guy in a white car in a white suit who ended up in a chair just like this in his back patio with a very thick photo album of his entire life with all the information about when he brushed his teeth, when he went to bed on average, where he went every single day, what was on his last credit card transaction, etc. Threatening him to his face, you need to let this one go. What was interesting is, is that he was at an infinitesimal level of his invention which was to use sound waves with an egg-shaped uh, device to resonate up any, any chemical or gas that he wanted by using the frequency of that material, that element within this container. We, he documented it, he published it, we published it on a website, and he got a lot of interest from a lot of eccentric places. But Homeland Security, of all places, stopped $2 million coming in from Europe. Because the guy uh, happened to be either Arab or tied to some Arab person. Interesting. And what's sad about it is they didn't pull him aside and say, why don't you make it for us, for the United States government? Why didn't they do that? Because his stuff is very remedial compared to the stuff that they actually can do. They don't need his sort of backyard invention. It may not have been an, an efficient model of creating it, but it was definitely, you could put a solar panel out there and at least create enough to keep a village with power. Hydrogen being the first target of his machine, which obviously can be metabolized into all kinds of forms of energy. But now how does any inventor invent something brand new? They stop, at least partially, trust learning. Bruce Lipton is the byproduct of arresting, if if ever believing the trust learning that he was learning in medical school. He took all the lessons that he learned and he took them into a laboratory and he tried to test them out and they didn't work half the time. One of the funniest theories is this, uh, I'll just mention this briefly, it's been two years or so since I went through this, but it's important at this point to discuss this. 
He was told that the nucleus of a cell is the brain of the cell. We can nucleate a cell and it lives a full life. But what would happen to a human being or any creature on earth if you paralyzed its brain, uh, hence removed it from the being? It doesn't continue, aside from a chicken and its little muscle loop that's got. The theory is called the dogma theory, apparently in the medical industry. Well, he re-engineered his thought process about how a cell works. And once he figured out that the membrane of a cell is actually the brain of the cell, it really controls all incoming and, and outgoing matter from the cell. That the center is simply there to repair and duplicate. It's, a very, it's the reproductive organs is really what the center of the cell is all about. And then he fell into epigenetics. And epigenetics is all based on the interaction with the surface of a cell. He didn't say much, I have to say, he didn't say much about the neurons in your brain. But he said that the information that we get from our epidermis is paramount to who we become as a being. But he also talked about the neural peptides, which is what, what the bleep do we know completely focused on, which is a chemical structure that can be configured with mental thought inside your mind, dumps into your bloodstream, and it will engineer who you are as a human being. So a lot of what you become is what you perceive you can be. It's very, very powerful. And again, it seems like a godlike design, doesn't it? The more absolute you believe you're one thing, you can become that one thing. My uncle graduated high school, and I think he was about 5'8 to 5'9, but he really wanted to be five or wanted to be six feet. And his father was like 5'7. 5'6, five, 5'7. Five, five, but he wanted to be six feet. And so he did the uh, Christopher Reeve. Uh, somewhere in time meditation, and he reached six feet. And he didn't go a single quarter inch over six feet because that's all he ever wanted to be. So he configured his neural peptides, in my opinion, to achieve that physical goal, and he succeeded. But we are extremely trusting, aren't we? It would be horrible to live in a society where we couldn't trust a single thing, but that is indeed where they're trying to push us. When you go to a fast food restaurant, you don't wonder whether or not this hamburger is going to kill you. But it could. It could be very intentional. could be that during the Thanksgiving dinners of the United States here in 2021, they want to spread a new thing, and so they put it in, like, millions and millions of turkeys. You know, it has to survive the cooking process and a bunch of other things, but they could. They could put Marburg in there, something that's going to survive a protein virus. Definitely will not get killed by heating it. And then all of a sudden, you know, over time, we all start getting sick. We trust the world. It is by nature that man trusts because otherwise existing would be this uh, incredibly excruciating existence. Is this real? Are you still there? Are you really my wife? Are you really my kid? Is that really the sun out there? You know, you don't want to live in that world. So this has to be done with moderation. For those of you who have uh, dabbled in the Mandela effect, you know that, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. They find new ones all the time. And it's not necessarily alarming. It's interesting. Because no Mandela effect switching, at least to this point, has ever caused you to lose your child. Well, don't, honey, don't you remember we had three kids? What are you talking about? We only have the two kids. What? You know, imagine growing up with your child up until eight years old, and then they disappear. And you're the only one in the entire world that remembers it the other way. Or maybe you got one other relative that might, yeah, that, yeah, what do you mean you don't have a daughter? Elizabeth, right? You know? Huge. But that doesn't happen, thank God. At least that I know of, okay? So when you undo, when you push the undo button and start to re sift through your massive, massive, you know, mega petabyte database array in your mind of everything that you've ever experienced, everything you've ever been told was true. Let it be fun. Let it be interesting that you're waking up one more time on another dimension of existence. And also realize that as you attain more information, your discerning circuits are going to be functioning properly for the very first time. I think what's sort of interesting, and, and I've mentioned this once before, but as we wake up in a particular area, we do feel compelled at times to get frustrated with others that don't believe us. You think you've seen conclusive proof about something. And again, sometimes you don't have the evidence. If you think the world is flat, for instance, to you, that's a big deal. To you, you've seen 
things that blow your mind. At least, you know, the whole idea that you shouldn't be able to see in any one direction as a six-foot man more than three and a half miles away from where you're sitting because the world's going to start curving so much that everything else is on the other side. But you can. You can, whether you're elevated or not. You still can. In Kansas, it's a big deal. In Kansas, there's areas where I believe you can stare something like 40 miles, and it's no big deal. Well, regardless, if you go up, the world's still going down regardless, right? So you see these things. You sit on the edge of a, of a shore with a 200x zoom camera, and regardless of what you think about the distortion of light using the atmosphere or the water coming off the ocean, for instance, they can see boats, you know, 14 miles out. Okay, that's a lot of curvature, right? So you might get something that you believe is that trigger mechanism that says, hey, I definitely do not believe what they told me. And at that point, you really are at a crossroad of previous information. But now you are saddled, if you are interested, with proving it. I mean, really, really proving it, right? By the way, I was watching, a, who, um, what's my line, excuse me? which is a 1950s show for 1950-1958. Uh, guests have to guess who, what your line of work is. And this dude came on the show, and he was a South Pole explorer. And one of the clarifications he made on the show, because they, they finished really early, they had some time to talk to the dude, and they interviewed him, and he said that Admiral Byrd was the guy that flew over the North Pole. He, this uh, very eccentric-looking dude, I, I wrote his name down, I believe, in my phone, which I don't have on me right now. It's a name like Hopkins or something like that, but he was the dude, the first guy that flew over the South Pole. And so, again, it's a claim. We have to trust that this guy is telling us the truth. But the major thing was that on national television, he said Bird was not the guy that flew over the South Pole, he was the guy that flew over the North Pole. And a lot of flat earthers have been told the opposite. Bird went down to the South Pole to do his research, but this show was in 1958. So Bird's career was pretty much done by that point. I think the first line of business is obviously, as I said, you go back and you reassess your past as it is important to you. There's only so many hours in the day, so don't lose them all to these little things unless you got time. My advice to anyone waking up today, regardless if you're into what I'm saying in this episode or any other thing that you're exploring, is to set up a scientific method and some sort of constraints that you define as to how you're going to do your research at any one of these things and to set aside a, an intense amount of time. Constraints might be, I'm not going to listen to these particular sources except to assess probably more of disinformation from certain sources via or uh, versus um, pure, pure information, right? The scientific method is to figure out whether or not you believe you've actually achieved any level of proof. And I know that some of you who are definitely Flat Earth enthusiasts, um, who are helping this show actually be, you're trying to find individuals on the ground to confirm things. And that's the best way to do it, let me tell you. I know that one of our folks has been trying to acquire a gyroscope that he can take onto a plane safely without getting, you know, stopped by TSA or something, but have it in his lap the entire time and fly from a northern region of the northern hemisphere to at least the equator or below to see if this thing, if spun, actually rotates to match the Earth's tilt as he crosses over quite a few longitudinal uh, axes on the Earth, right? It's not easy. You know, spare, you know, forget expense. It wasn't even an expense thing. He was going to raise the money if he could just figure out the price. But these units are designed for dashboards and other things, and they're all made by a company apparently run by NASA. But again, that's a claim. I can't confirm it. I saw it in a video on YouTube, right? The other one, too, is that we are very scattered as human beings at this point. So it, let me ask you this. Of any of, of, any of the things that you've ever become conscious of, have you been able to attain, let's say, more than two other friends who are as dedicated to researching this particular claim as you are? In my lounge, with a bunch of people coming in, probably between 2015 to, say, 2018, uh, we had lots of people coming in. 
wanting to know the truth, but the problem was they hadn't done any research because life was busy. Some of them probably don't have the aptitude to do it. They're just not built like that. So out of the room of people wanting to know the truth, only a small fraction of people are actually doing any level of research. And the thing is, is as you're unraveling a scam of some sort, your smeller, your sniffer for the scam is really, for each individual conspiracy that you might follow, it's at ground zero. Meaning, you don't have your faculties together. You don't understand how the PSYOP is running. Is it coming? Oh, gosh, that I was really trusting the source, for instance, and I found out later it was run by this individual that's been involved with a bunch of other snake oil salesman things. So that can be tough. Someone will be telling you, uh, a lot of things that seem like they're factual. And then they start feeding you things that keep fizzling out. And so you're like, oh God, I thought this person was very reliable. And now I understand that that person believes the first thing that they're ever told. And it usually has to do with a lack of background of any scientific nature. They're unable to discern. It sounded good to them. They repeated it to you. And then the extra cream on top is the knee-jerk reaction person person that just heard it two minutes ago and is now texting it to 50 people. Now, in some cases, those resources in my circle have been very upfront about the fact that, hey, I just learned this. I don't know if it's true. You're the one with the background. Give me your opinion. I'm asking 20 other people who I believe also have similar backgrounds because I'm going to aggregate up the opinions. That is a great process as well. But again, when you research things, you want to put in constraints of what your sources are going to be, and the scientific method to deduce whether or not there's any conflicts in the stories of the sources that you've actually validated. For instance, when I went out to disprove Roswell crash, my constraint was I'm only going to listen to interviews with the really either the eyewitness first degree people or the second degree people who knew the people that were the first degree people. I don't want anyone, and, and the other constraint was I don't want anyone is selling a book at the time of the interview or around the interview or just before the interview. Now, the only one that I know really sold a book was the, uh, the gentleman that found the wreckage waited until the late 70s, I mean 30 years, to, to uh, write a book. And then his son, who turned into a physician, wrote a book just uh, 2017. So it waited a very, very long time. Their testimonies were in... And so the scientific method was to figure out, okay, one, is everyone's story that is, that is of this constrained nature capable of being pushed into one book and it all is congruent? And the answer was emphatically, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now, what I figured out was when I saw the gentleman from the military who actually had to protect and keep the one surviving gray you know, safe, who was 100% intact, no damage, when he gets out in the desert and starts tearing up when he was talking about what this little guy was uh, communicating to him in two thoughts, that for me was, oh, wow. I mean, this dude is having this experience over again. He's repeating this thing. He's having an emotional thing. Guy's in his 70s, barely any teeth in his head. And you can see at night with a crappy camera, he is tearing up big time and just trying to swallow a frog, man. So my thought was, if, if this town had been terrorized somehow, which was a military town, but not everybody given testimonies worked for the military by any means. In fact, most of them didn't. Somehow conducting a military, you know, mental psyop prior to bringing over the Germans from Germany. It's too much. It's too many people having to be brainwashed and then remember that story 20, 30, 40 years later. People are artificially accused or wrongly accused, I should say, of changing their story over and over and over. And then when you read the, the quotes from them, watch their interviews, especially their interviews, man, it's, it's 100% the same. Like the, the mortician guy. They said that guy changed his story a bunch of times. He just happens to be one of the eyewitnesses of his friend who was the nurse working on the uh, the bodies, the two that were injured. But his story remained the same over 40 years. Now, 
There's been a cyclical thing that's actually very important to recognize, in my opinion, which is that you go back 200 years, the amount of disinformation was sort of understood that you were, say, in uh, Kansas and you're listening to someone tell you what happened in Washington, D.C. Like, Lincoln gets shot and John Wilkes Booth is supposed to be the guy that does it. I guarantee you there was more skepticism about the data coming in for probably the first two or three years and it took probably a decade of the information coming in at more excruciating detail for them to believe it. Now, there's still you know, a bunch of disinformation about that story. He did not die in a barn. He died on an island outside of England. Okay, so you fast forward into our time frame, and it's closer you come to the 21st century, especially 2021, every single year it gets worse and worse and worse. Aren't you, uh, well, I don't know about European communities, but when you're taught about yellow journalism in America by the Hearst Corporation, I don't know if you own newspapers in Europe, you tell me. We understood that there was this baron out there who was extremely wealthy, buying up all the little newspapers across the United States and injecting a narrative that was false, harming people. You learn that mechanism exists, but they tell you in a romantic story that the bad guys were stopped. And now... The news is 100% true. And indeed, we might go through air pockets of, of true news for a little while. But it comes right back with a vengeance, and it comes back even harder and better and more insulated against the truth. Now, the interesting thing is, is serendipity is an amazing thing. We've talked about this a lot with the NASA episodes. NASA relies on you believing pretty much stuff that you learned in... Journey to the Moon, uh, Buck Rogers episodes, all the 50s shows that had rockets, a lot of Twilight Zones had rockets. You saw rockets working in space. As long as there was a cone and fire coming out the back, you believe this actually works in a in terms of a, a solid matter uh, region of space, that this is pushing off of something and therefore getting you from point A to point B, making you believe that we know what's above this plane of existence, which we call Earth. And so when they were set up to do the moon missions, we were set up with, I don't know, let's see, it was 1969, so you go back at least 40 years probably of things we had seen. If you go all the way back to 1905 or 1915, you're talking about nearly 70 years, 65 years worth of conditioning to believe that the technology they said would work actually worked. I was sitting in my lounge the other day and a buddy of mine was looking at some of the most hokey footage of the lunar lander coming back up to the service module. If you know anything about science, that is one of the sort of linchpin smoking guns that this is all bullshit. But he's sitting there saying, see, I thought that footage right there was the most convincing footage of the entire thing. (laughs) Has no scientific background, doesn't want to put the effort in, and he doesn't champion the whole thing anyway. He's actually more on the, on the, side of the fence that we didn't go. But it's interesting, when he sees something that makes absolutely no scientific sense, it, for him, was so pretty in the camera that it was the most convincing element of the whole journey. But now I will tell you that, just like in boxing, when someone's faking you out with a move, they're swinging there, they're kind of jab, 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 and they get you taught that this left jab is going to be constantly there. And they make a move like the left jab is coming back out again. But this, you know, like Richard Pryor said, this punch starts in Mississippi, starting to come at you from the right. And that's the one that's going to put you on your back. That's exactly how they work in the trust learning realm of science and in the world and how it works, usually in politics, to be honest. What's the left jab? Left jab is pay attention to this crisis over here. Pay attention to a moon thing. We're going to drop even a little bit of psyop stuff to make you understand that the rover was not put, the Tesla, or Roadster, excuse me, Tesla Roadster, was definitely not up in low orbit. Lower than the space station, but you could see the entire Earth in the background. <laughs> Absolutely hilarious. They said they had modified the car, but one of the shots uh, goes right through the wheel well, and there's no engine in it. You know, I mean, the tires didn't explode. The... The plastic didn't melt. It was just a joke. The whole thing was a complete joke, right? And I met a guy that works at at uh, SpaceX who was one of these kids who, you know, validates himself through bullshit. And, you know, he 
we're sitting at this funeral and I'm talking to him and he's like, well, you know, you know, they said that we, we did this thing on green screen. You know how they leaked out that, that picture that, of our studio with all the green sins, you know, the one that Photoshop got photoshopped. I'm looking at this guy going, he's an artist. I'm sitting there going, dude, I'm a Photoshop expert. I'm telling you that was a real shot. Give me a, give me a break. But his insecurities are that he has joined an organization, validated himself which is stupid. He's, he already is valid. He's an incredible artist, right? So nothing's going to invalidate his art, but he wanted his institution not to suffer. So he carries around this psychosis, projecting his own insecurities that he knows the roadster didn't go up there. But they get you to pay attention to these little things, such that they sucker punch you with a bunch of tyranny on the side. You had no idea it's coming, and it's already passed before you know it. What's fascinating to me about the trust learning is the level of absolute rudimentary systemic indoctrination that comes through trust learning. You know, I, I didn't probably realize it to probably the 90s that I had been conditioned to trust individuals on television. A Peter Jennings, a, a Wolf Blitzer, you know. You trust these people. They just become these sort of like grandpas. And, you know, one of the first legit ones was uh, John Charles Daly, who was the host of What's My Line. He was a very, very reputable guy, probably very trusting in his own right of other people. But he was a do-right kind of guy. But he was one of the first sort of sweethearts on TV before Brokaw, before any of those dudes ever got on TV. He was the guy that actually announced on the radio in 1941 that we had been attacked by the Japanese. That's how far back that dude goes. So he had these legit archetypes that came up. And so they figured that out. They figure it out and they usurp it and they, re, they resubmit it to you. The baby boomer generation. And, you know, again, Hunter S. Thompson was a baby boomer. And he was hardly asleep, right? And there's a few of you out there who are completely awake. You woke up and you realize what's going on. But there's some sympathy and empathy to be sort of expressed on the baby boomer that grew up as the first generation pure, puro version of this situation. They were raised on absolutely regal people on television telling them what was true. You know, uh, people writing articles in the New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, all these places, they, they were legit organizations at one point and then turned into the Operation Mockingbird folks, right? Now remember, when asked in 1970 at a Senate hearing, the CIA had to admit that Mockingbird employed anywhere from 700 to 1,000 people in journalism to control the media. And, and then they clarified, I believe if I'm right, the, the clarifying sentence that was spoken on top of by the senator was they said, you know, but we've got all the top folks. So even, out of, even if it's just 700, we got all the top folks. We totally control them. And the idea would be, I don't know, well, actually, I should say, my assumption in the priority list would definitely be whatever is being consumed the most. Now, the thing is, you can turn a TV on and see a program, but then you turn it off and it wasn't in a DVR, you weren't recording it anywhere. But the one that was in a DVR format was called a newspaper. It's printed, someone could buy the newspaper, read it on the subway, and when they're done, they just leave it on the subway. Then another person picks that up for free and reads it. So the, the newspaper for me in a magazine was a little bit later, was the best source to, to attack first, then television. But anyone in television is going to want that ego play. And so they're going to most likely be cheaper, to be honest, because the newspaper runs around with a journalistic integrity. That was the point of it. And of course, movies were greenlit constantly to reiterate how integral the journalistic doctrine was inside newspapers. Well, I can't print it. There's no sources. How many times have you heard that in old movies? That was to make sure that people like my mother and father believed that these organizations were checked, that the editors would never lie. They could never be paid off, right? And the thing is, there is a cause and effect model that is then validated, which is the following. And a bunch of it is absolute faux. Like I told you about the angel power thing. 
Imagine the cause and effect models of what was really going on is constantly pre-planned. So we're going to create this scam and then when the scam busts, we're going to flip it this way, that way, this way. We have complete support by television, media, you know, newspapers, magazines. Pundits will go out and talk about it and we'll reinforce the spin on this thing. Like Wag the Dog the movie. And so these boom boomers that never ever wake up, they go out. They serendipitously get hit just like anyone else. And then when the crisis comes in, all they're looking for is a reason to sound intelligent in a conversation. Hence, they get fed the narrative. They repeat the narrative. And in a demented, zero research, no everything mentality, they're completely done with, with the, the effect of what actually occurred. Gus Grissom dying in the Apollo 1 capsule with his other two guys. Okay, they were murdered. The official report is they got cyanided before they burned. <laughs> what, was that, uh, you know, some alternate uh, oxygen they, they pump into them? No. They were killed to make it merciful, merciful without any pain. A little bit of fire in the cabin. They have an explosive bolt door right next to them so they could just pull that door and pop that thing out and all the air would get sucked out and the fire would be done. What the hell's going to burn inside of the capsule anyway, right? But they told you that it was a piece of Velcro, it was a button that flicked or whatever. And, and the button was most likely replaced to kick off the cyanide uh, in their suits because they're breathing something that's being fed to them. So click the button, it was replaced the night before, they get the cyanide, they all die very quickly, then a fire erupts, and you have this official story of what took place until you read the 11-inch thick report that Gus and his, Gus's wife and son, who's a commercial pilot nowadays, has at their house, the Bart Sibrel has read. You trust. You trust, 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 trust. Now the game is, can we fix the world while we're still trusting each other? Or are we going to have to devolve down to the point of so many like crises being put on us, so many attacks of various kinds, whatever they might be, essentially lies, 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 before we, you know, muscle up and say, okay, someone tells you something and you simply say, well, that's just your opinion, man. I'll believe it when I see it. And not on television and not in a magazine, not on your telephone. When I'm standing there and something happens like a UFO flies over, anyone on this show still listening is going to, I mean, think about it. You've seen all the episodes on UFOs and my fake alien invasion analyses, right? Imagine us standing in a supermarket, and let's just say it was a much smaller planet, and I know that there's some of you in the uh, parking lot of a grocery store or something. I don't know which ones of you listen to the show, but I guarantee you, if these things fly over, and then, you know, they're gone for a split second, and then we start looking around, those people screaming, panicking, I don't listen to the show. But once I see one of you just look at me and kind of grin, I'll be like, Anything about Deep Thoughts Radio, you know, they would be like, hey, dude, I, I recognize your face, man. And it's, we're going to be fine. We're going to be evaluating whether or not it's true. It still will be an amazing experience to see whatever the hell they come up with. But it's, I'm sure it's going to be only over the United States. That's the other funny thing. There's one other digression about that that I since kind of came to an epiphany. Because these Tic Tacs and Gimbals only fly over, you know, military control airspace, on, on any one particular day, let's just say, because they commandeer areas to do testing. Obviously, again, they're, they're trying to see if it falls in the water and they'll go pick it up and you'll never hear about that particular sighting. But if they really wanted to do this big world invasion, they really can't pull it off, in my opinion, because I don't think Putin will go along with it. Not sure that uh, China needs to do it. They already have complete control of their people. Don't know if the Indian uh, India would lie to their people. Don't know. I mean, who knows? I mean, you got to go one guy will sell it in two seconds, but there's not enough people at the top of military going, yeah, what are you talking about? Fake, man? fuck you, man. I'm not doing that. So, and again, some areas like South America, Africa, it's just too um, big to get everybody on the same page. And everyone's going to want to control the vehicles over their land. They just do. Whether or not they have the technical capability capability to do it or not, obviously that varies. 
These are going to be very secret vehicles. And, you know, they could get as many assurances as possible. Don't even worry, a thing will never land on your land. But the thing is, for every single vehicle they put in the sky that might be fake, one of them's going to go down. And, it, and it's going to be higher and higher ratio the more they do this. And so they're going to have to have crews in place all along the flight paths to make sure that if one of these things falls out of the sky, it's going to be reported as one's downed and we're rushing to the scene to see what's going on. When it's not big enough to carry a person and it's just a vehicle, they're going to announce it's a probe. And then we're back to square one. But now on the subject of trust learning, imagine that day happens. Somehow they work all that logistical stuff out. It's a big trust learning day, ain't it? Do you have to trust what you see in the sky is something that just could be made here on Earth? You're going to have to trust all this information. And believe me, here's the interesting thing. And you guys know this for a fact. You've been through this dozens and dozens of times. Guarantee it. When something horrible happens in the world, the dude driving through the parade the other day, it's this crazy car accident thing. It's the rubbernecking deal, but you're doing it to all the media that's out there. You might immediately conceive someone is orchestrating this event. It may not be the case, but that's what it feels like, right? If nothing else, the guy's feeble acorn brain is definitely being programmed by the system. Sure, that, I'm sure that happened. That guy's just got a mental defect that goes back a long way, right? Believes everything he's told. There's this whole new theory that the Rittenhouse kid is one of the kids from that school that got shot up that we never saw any bodies from that Alex Jones has had a big problem with. You know, I listen, I listen. I get everything 20 times from everybody, which is just fine. You keep sending it. I'll just filter it the best I can. But it's all trust, 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 trust. Let me take your guns, trust me. You'll never need them again. Well, not for you, I won't, but uh, I mean, not for, sorry, you won't need them, but I, I will. It'd be interesting to build a school, K through 12, and then, you know, undergrad, grad, and, uh, doctorate that was built on this principle. I think right away the amount of classes that we would teach would be very meat potatoes, right? This is how the English language works. This is how French works, how German works, you know, all these different languages in the world. It simply is a mathematical reality. In terms of the sciences, well, we could say what we understand is in a laboratory you mix these two chemicals together and this reaction occurs. And we use this paradigm of thinking called physics to understand how this works. It might be something completely different in terms of causality, but this is the paradigm of thinking that we use to understand it. What that would do is get the kid the knowledge that they need to go potentially solve a problem somewhere in the world, but it also leaves their mind open to continue to interpret causality. Imagine getting a PhD from this kind of school. Instead of a school closing your mind every day that you're alive, it opens your mind every day that you're alive. The other thing is to say, okay, you want to learn language. Well, here's how this works. Any one language on earth has probably 12,000 words, at least 12,000 unique words. You tell a child, here's what's going to happen. We're trying to teach you words so that when you have a thought in your brain, you can express it to another human being. Why? Because you may need assistance in executing something in the world and your language is going to make it easier. The other one is that you may want to have someone understand what you just did or how you feel. Why you put red paint on the canvas versus purple paint or purple and red together. You want to be able to communicate that. Now, hopefully you don't have to explain your artwork, but you know, you tell one guy on the side and he acts like he interpreted it. It helps, trust me. But to tell them, look, you're, you're going to be able to function in this world with just as little as 1,200 words. But the reality is you're leaving behind the overwhelming 90% of your own language. And so if you desire to master this universe, it's probably imperative that you add at least half of what a Civil War soldier had, which was ten to 12,000 words. School is in itself the final product, which is your diploma, is a giant trust paradigm, is it not? 
if I get this degree, I can accomplish this, this amount of stuff. If I get this degree, I can go off and do this specialized stuff. In a lot of cases where it's black and white, it's absolutely true. Getting employed doesn't necessarily mean that anything significant is happening in your life, as many, as many of us has learned, right? The, the byproduct of this whole thing is, for me, it boils down to one little sentiment, which is, which is if you don't trust something entirely, it doesn't mean you're going into hysterics, it doesn't mean you're angry. The second that you don't trust something in full, the beauty of the situation is, is you do one thing as a counter reaction to that. You start doing what's called asking questions. Questions sometimes, well, I would say in a very indoctrinated mind, they, if I said, well, what, what is the general process of asking a question? And someone would say, I ask the question and someone else answers it. Some other human being is there and answers the question for me. I'm seeking information. But the more that you're an original thinker, you realize that part of it is, I ask a question, and I answer it myself. I go to the research and answer it myself. Think about all these incredible inventors out there. Did Tesla have anyone else to ask as to how he refined a capacitor, a resistor, etc., etc.? I mean, how did he do that? Because he thought for himself. He realized that there's no one out there to answer those questions but himself. Edison. I mean, everyone has employees. But all the famous people that are you know, legendary in history that we do believe participated at least at some point, we trust they did. They figured it out on their own. Once you gain that power, because you understand that you are actually way more capable than you were ever told when you were young, depending on what kind of family you had. And again, almost every family has a threshold. They'd be like, well, you could figure it out. You could figure it out. At some point, like, well, you should go ask that person, you know. Now, don't be uh, trying to get the answers to high, high explosives in your house all by yourself. You might want to do a little bit of uh, theoretical research on paper. Don't get yourself hurt. But, you know, you think about, we, we talk about the pyramids all the time because they're very alluring objects. And we know that it took more than one person to build them. At least we we're pretty sure it took more than one person to build them. And again, the algorithm for any methodology of constructing them, because there's a lot of fun videos on YouTube trying to figure out how they do it, you'll come up with these theories that actually technically kind of make some sense with levers and stuff. But it, it would take like, you know, nearly a month to put one stone in place and you multiply that times two and a half million stones per uh pyramid and you're talking about a tremendous amount of time. So some of these theories don't make any sense. But think about the individuals that finally figured out how to do this. Lots of pyramids before the Great Pyramids. How did they figure this out? Was it one person having an epiphany? Well, you know what's interesting about it is because these structures are so large, we automatically um, refuse to accept such a theory. Now, in our own recorded history, especially in the last, say, 100 years, where we've got lots of video and things of people experimenting and stuff, it's typically you're standing on the shoulder of someone else, and they're standing on your shoulders, and et cetera, up and up until you actually come up with the mathematics to pull something off. But here's the, here's the kicker with that education. It's a bit of a digression, but we're wrapping up the episode. I, I just wanted to impart on you this interesting theory because it's not enough to create a whole other Egyptian episode. If you're going to stand on the shoulders of giants to create a mathematical object known as a pyramid, well, in this world, with all the tools that we have to just educate each other, not build it, but educate each other on the mathematics, one has to, okay, one has to write it down before you die, the mathematics of what you're trying to accomplish. And that tome, that method of writing stuff down has to get passed to the next generation to then build on top of it. And you're probably going to have generations that didn't get that information until they were past their formative years. Or even if they're young, they don't have that teacher to explain what the hell that teacher wrote down. So either the scribe is going to have to beautifully put it in a one, two, three ABC system to be educated to the next generation. Otherwise, you're going to have a big gap. Well, I got these equations. I don't know what they mean, right? Tesla's paperwork that I looked at was very much like that. 
I had to study his entire past to get to a point of being able to do that. So the fact that the hieroglyphs don't have any accounting for this really, really begs the question. And the idea that, you know, people say, oh, the Masons did it, you know, a few hundred years back. Well, that's romantic. But then again, how are we sitting in the 21st century with no plausible documentary that can really explain building the hundreds of pyramids that are in Egypt? I mean, we can't do it. Wouldn't someone, just out of sheer ego, step up to the plate and go, okay, here's how we do it. I'm a Mason, 50th degree Mason, let me show you. Bop, 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 bop. And again, let's, let's be clear, because we're never clear about this, and this is kind of pathetic. So we we pretty sure that the Masons got their, got their chops being engineers of temples and cities and water wells and aqueducts. They were builders. They were engineers. Okay, how many centuries back did they lose that talent? Because no one is one of those anymore in the Masons. They're just dudes looking for a place to smoke cigars and wear an apron. It looks like a Gmail logo. Hmm. So they've lost their way. Their entire foundational Latin root word of what they are is no longer what they are known for. I mean, you know, the Pinkertons were known for security. You got problems, you call the Pinkertons, they'll solve that problem for you in the 1800s. Okay, great. So if we had engineering issues, where are the Masons coming in with that tome? They roll out this leather tome, they have this laptop in there, and it's just got all the good stuff. What are you looking for? They don't let you look at it, but like, what are you trying to do? Oh, we're trying to build, you know, uh, Tower of Babylon again. Oh, okay, yeah, that's easy. It's, that's an old school thing. Pop, 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 pop. Print it out right there. There's the schematics. See you later. Give me the billion dollars. Nope. So where are the tomes? Where's the information? Where's the very history that these that these particular people built these particular structures? And how is it that it's completely and utterly erased, but the people still exist? It's the old evolutionary argument to say if we evolved from primates, then why are primates still there? What you're telling me is that their genetic code turns into Homo sapiens sapien. Okay. Okay, Mr. Evolutionary Person. If that genetic code's in there, then why do they still exist? They would have all evolved at the exact same time, out of that form, into us. Amen. A dog has a nose, ears, mouth. Doesn't mean they were the previous me, you know? Trust learning. It's dangerous, man. I want you to, want you to consider inserting this in your conversation because I think it'll change people. You're in the middle of like some cocktail conversation and you're like, oh, so you're still trust learning. Not to belittle anybody, but to shake up their brain. They'll be like, what are you talking about? Oh, you're just repeating what you trusted was the truth. And you'll get the standard replies. Well, dude, how are, we supposed to, how are we supposed to live in the world without trust learning? And then you say, well, that's a good question. How should we live in the world without trusting everything that we're told? Maybe it's called uh, get off your ass learning, you know, research learning. Some people can't stomach just the single thought in their brain of having to verify a single thing that's inside their brain. It's not you, but they're all around you. Anyway, let me know what you think. This one for me has been floating around for several months. I just uh, quipped this in a conversation. I was like, ooh, I better write that down. Get this little bug flying on my face. Check it out. <laughs> anyway, if you have been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. I don't know if a bug will fly on your face there, but... Uh, Eventually, maybe. But I've got all the audio, video, social media, all new remastered season one, a store with a couple of fun shirts in there. We also have the uh, uh, the really shirt, which is the Apollo shirt, where if you're trying to get someone to understand, really, did we really land on the moon with this pile of junk? Uh, it's a great shirt. We also have the Deep Thoughts University shirt, which is marked 2015, because that's the anniversary of the foundation of the show itself. Still working on the intro, finally making some progress in some of my designs. I've been doing design this one thing for like three months and it just was not satisfied. Finally had a breakthrough. Also been very busy, so I apologize. We'll just crank them out, man. But to all the Patreons and PayPal people, thank you so much. Remember, when you sign up for PayPal, you get, or Patreon, excuse me, you get the, uh, 
the uh, fireside chats. There's up to 15 of them at this point, so you can learn what's going on in my daily grind. Plus, you will get inside those episodes, usually a preview of what's going on in my list of episodes to come. And you get access to me a lot better than uh, other other outlets. So, for those of you who go through that route, thank you so much and make the show happen. Take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over and out.